Perfect. Hello, welcome to RBCM at Home. My name is Kim Goff, and I'm a learning program developer here at the Royal BC Museum. I'm coming to you today from the museum, which is located on the territories of the Lekwungen people, known today as the Songhees and the Squamalt First Nations in Victoria, British Columbia. The term two-spirit was coined in 1990 during a conference of gay and lesbian activists in Winnipeg. And the term is used to refer to the range of possible possibilities for gender identities amongst indigenous peoples and cultures. Words to describe up to six different gender variants beyond the binary male and female have been found in 155 indigenous nations languages of North America. And it wasn't until colonialism and aggressive Christian influence that being gay became stigmatized in their cultures. RBCM at Home started in 2020 as a response to the pandemic and to people not being able to visit the museum. It began as an opportunity to talk to staff about what they were working on from home. Now, even though the museum is reopened, we've continued this program as a way of staying connected with people all around the province and beyond. This program and previous ones have been recorded and you can find them on the Royal BC Museum's YouTube channel. Today, I welcome Sarah Marie Werthmann. Sarah is a master's student from Memorial University in St. John's, Newfoundland. Today, she'll talk about her report based on the research she conducted for the LGBT Purge Fund to reveal the untold queer history of the Canadian Expeditionary Force in World War I. Drawing from records that have never been seen, Sarah's research provides insight and reveals these histories for the first time. Her report chronicles stories of these brave young men and recounts the hardships they endured at the hands of the Canadian government. These are difficult stories to hear. And once we get started, Sarah will provide a language and content disclaimer. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. All right. I'm just going to share my screen there. Uh, can everyone see the, the screen? Perfect, perfect. Technology, huh? <laughs> so um, my name is Sarah, as it was said. Uh, I am the, uh, so yeah, I am the executive director of the Newfoundland and Labrador Career Research Initiative. Uh, and this specific project was funded more so uh, by me as an individual researcher uh, by the LGBT Purge Fund. Uh, and so it is because of those stories um, and their support that we're able to share this today. And so my interest in the 2S LGBTQIA plus history of the First World War started initially when I was 18 years old and I was working my first ever job in commemoration. I was hired by Veterans Affairs Canada to work as a tour guide in France and uh, in, just one sec, I think. Okay, cool. I'm just making sure I have issues with the screen, sorry. Um, okay. So yes, my interest originally started uh, when I was working my first ever job as a tour guide at Beaumont Hamel over in France uh, and at Vimy Ridge. Uh, and so uh, when things were pretty slow on the sites, we were allowed to research additional information to include in our tours. Uh, and as a young queer person, I was very keen to ask the question, why is it that we are not included in this type of history? And so I started to dig and uh, the more I found, the more questions that I had. Uh, and often the answers I got were unsatisfactory. It was along the lines of, yeah, well, people probably, queer people existed, uh, but records simply do not exist, uh, which you'll learn in this presentation today is very much incorrect. So flash forward to 2021, and I'm once again working uh, on a research project of the names behind each soldier on the Canadian National Vimy Memorial in France. And while working on that project, I came across court martial records for the first time. Court martial had a category of criminal charges in this era uh, that I had known from some of my other research into queer history, sodomy. I was really lucky at the time, and I had a supervisor who let me pursue this further. Sadly, about a year and a half into the project, we got a new one who, in collaboration with my director, worked to silence this research uh, on the basis of not wanting to offend descendants who might potentially be homophobic. Uh, 
They even went so far as to cut out lines that explicitly mentioned sexuality from presentations. Needless to say, when my contract was up in May 2022, I was devastated. I felt in a way that I had failed my community in not getting these stories out there. And I was determined to do whatever I could to share the history I had worked so diligently to gather. Enter the LGBT Purge Fund. In 2016, survivors of the 2S LGBTQIA purge launched a nationwide class action lawsuit against the Canadian government. A historic settlement was reached in June 2018 for the victims of the purge and the Canadian queer community more broadly. Totaling about $145 million, the LGBT Purge Fund uh, was set up to manage a portion of the funds that emerged from that settlement. They mainly focus on reconciliation and memorialization measures, including the creation of the first ever 2S LGBTQIA plus national monument that will be located in Ottawa. I heard about their work from some acquaintances in the community who had encouraged me to submit a project proposal. To the immense surprise of my imposter syndrome, they loved the research uh, and agreed to both fund and publish uh, my report on the First World War. Much of the funding uh, for my research comes from the victims of the purge who did not live long enough to receive individual compensation. And I'm really honored to be chosen to continue that legacy of raising awareness about Canada's long history of queer persecution. And so you may have noticed I've used language around queer uh, and a couple of other terms throughout. Uh, and so before I actually talk about my findings, it's important to discuss terminology. Many of you will already be familiar with the term queer. Uh, formally queer is a term that serves as an umbrella term for the 2S LGBTQA plus community. It can include, but is not limited to, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, two-spirit, intersex, and asexual people. In the past, queer has been used as a slur towards members of the community. However, it has in recent years been reclaimed as an identity marker. And that's in particular important in the historical context, uh, because a lot of the identities within the acronym, uh, specifically the labels, are relatively modern terms. Uh, for example, think of a famous person from queer history, say Walt Whitman. If you were to travel back in time and refer to him as gay, he would not have the faintest idea what that word means. Uh, you see terms like gay, bisexual, transgender, and even homosexual are relatively modern identity markers. Homosexuality wasn't even formally coined until 1868. Uh, and many use the term homophile well into the 20th century as an identity marker. And since we unfortunately do not have a time machine uh, to ask historical figures how they would identify, although that would save save a lot of time, it would definitely make the job a lot easier. <laughs> um, many historians stress the term queer to use in this context because of its ability to identify a wide range of identities. As well, uh, I want to give a caution about some of the content uh, that I will be discussing today. Uh, I will discuss incarceration, suicide, uh, and violent discrimination against uh, the 2S LGBTQIA plus community as well as anti-Black racism. So if at any moment you need to take a step away uh, or mute me or anything like that, that is absolutely no problem. Um, please, uh, please do so and uh, bear that in mind as we continue. So my findings in total, I've identified 35 trials uh, of men who were arrested during the First World War for gross indecency within the Canadian Expeditionary Force. Of those 35, I've identified 19 men who were imprisoned for consensual queer, who were arrested and some imprisoned for consensual queer relationships. As well, I've identified 12 men who were imprisoned because of this and an additional four men who were dismissed or cashiered simply because of their sexual orientation. And so what I really wanna stress here is that there's a very long history of legal persecution, really <laughs> dating back to you know, just like how it was said at the beginning of the presentation by Kim, really dating back to that uh, pre-colonial 
period when a European settlers started to arrive in the land of what was Turtle Island, but of course we now know as North America. Uh, and so both the French and English colonial governments criminalized sodomy, a term which in formal legislation was vague at best, um, but typically referred to any kind of intercourse that did not result in procreation. We also later on introduced a term that was essentially introduced to replace sodomy called gross indecency. Much like sodomy, gross indecency referred to any form of sex that did not result in uh, heterosexual uh, procreation. However, uh, unlike its predecessor, gross indecency did not require direct evidence in order to convict individuals. This meant that legally queer people could be convicted based on speculation alone. And individuals who dared to hold hands with their partner or dance with a member of the same sex in public could risk being arrested under this new law. This legacy of legal persecution really continued in Canada uh, well into the 1990s. You see, while it was officially decriminalized uh, in 1969, uh, the LGBT purge persisted and it was completely legal for the Canadian federal government to persecute uh, and directly target queer people who worked within the federal government, military and RCMP. Uh, and they were allowed to be dismissed because of their sexual orientation. As well, the LGBT purge resulted in kind of thousands of, uh, of police monitoring queer groups across the country. Uh, and every single organization uh, from Newfoundland to, uh, to out to BC where you folks are would have had RCMP spies uh, dedicated to uh, targeting and outing any members of the community who might be working in a federal position. This continued to be a part of the government structure in Canada until 1992, when it was formally struck down by lawsuit. And of course, that informal policy continued well into the 1990s and 2000s and still has ramifications for how government structure functions to this day. And what I really want to stress here is that while we are able to see this unique instance um, in Canada's queer history, we, it's important to acknowledge that it's not isolated whatsoever. And in fact, it was part of a strategic policy approach on behalf of the Canadian government that still impacts how our government runs to this day. So with that in mind, um, this leads us to the First World War, which I have found is a bit of a queer paradox, so to speak. And so a lot of the history I plan on sharing tonight is quite sad. Um, it's important uh, to note that for every minute we recognize the sadness in queer history, it's incredibly necessary to also recognize the joy and the queer people who survived despite all of the odds. And the war is a perfect example of this paradox uh, because along with the tragedy that came associated with queer persecution, there came these beautiful pockets of unprecedented queer joy. For the first time in Canada's history, people from all over the country were being mobilized on a wide scale from coast to coast. This meant that for many individuals, it was the first time they would be exposed to queer connection uh, and actually meet other queer people. And along with it came love, and we can look no further to uh, the stories shared by historians Meredith, Meredith Batt and Dusty Green about Lennon Cub here on, on the right, who are from Havelock, New Brunswick. They served together in the war and managed to evade persecution. As well, one of the most kind of unique 
examples of queerness in the war was the art of female impersonation, uh, which we now know today uh, eventually evolved into drag. These performers were an essential component of wartime entertainment, and every divisional concert troupe would have included one to two drag performers. While it wasn't explicitly queer, drag was one of the few sanctioned ways for queer men to receive attention from members of the same sex, and even sanctioned ways of public queer affection. There's one account of a drag performer, for example, named Kitty, who actually kissed her commanding officer during one of her performances in 1917. Uh, and she was celebrated by the audience for doing so. Another interesting component of this paradox is the story of the countless nursing sisters during the war, who many had met and would become lifelong partners as a result. One example uh, that I like to share uh, of, uh, of nursing sisters who fell in love is the story of Myrnie Pugh and Eleanor Parker, whose whose uh, collection is actually featured in the Royal BC Museum. So Lieutenant Eleanor Parker was born in 1883 in Northern Ireland. Around 1908, she made her way to Canada and enlisted in the nursing program at the Winnipeg General Hospital. Eleanor then started diligently working in the field in Manitoba. When the war broke out, she was in one of the first contingents of Canadian nurses to go overseas. Myrnie, on the other hand, came from a very different background. She was born into a prominent military family in 1883 in Kingston, Ontario. Myrnie completed her nursing training in Halifax just before the war. And in 1914, Myrnie followed her family's pattern of being involved in the military and eagerly enlisted with the Canadian Army Medical Corps at the first opportunity. Both Myrnie and Eleanor did not cross paths during the same first year of the war, despite working in the same region. They officially met in England at Salisbury Plain in the Netherhaven Hospital. And it was from that moment that the couple would be inseparable and would work at the exact same hospitals in France, where they treated all kinds of casualties from mustard gas to shrapnel victims. While treating gas victims at Bimmy Ridge, Myrnie and Eleanor both suffered from gas poisoning. Myrnie only experienced mild symptoms, but her partner would suffer from respiratory health problems for the rest of her life. While Eleanor recovered in hospital, Myrnie continued to serve as a nursing sister. And when the war ended in 1919, the pair returned to North America on board a hospital ship. They settled down in the incredibly queer neighborhood, <laughs> I cannot express that enough, uh, of West Hollywood uh, and lived there during the golden age of underground cinema, literature and drag balls. Myrnie continued to work as a nurse while Eleanor kickstarted her literary career. She would go on to publish countless journal articles, poems and two novels. She also even dabbled in inventing and helped the Allied cause in the Second World War. While in California, they would self-identify as partners on two separate census documents. Sadly, by the late 1940s, the United States government had become a lot less lenient uh, towards relationships like theirs, and many were persecuted under Cold War era homophobic policies. And perhaps that was why Eleanor and Murney opted to return to Canada in 1948. Regardless of the reasoning, the pair settled down in Victoria, BC, and would remain there until their deaths. Eleanor died in 1965 at the age of 87, and Myrnie died nine years later at the age of 92, and they are buried today in Victoria, BC, uh, and you can actually go and visit their graveyards if, if you um, visit their grave if you live there. Throughout their lives, the couple were referred to as companions and variations of life partners in multiple newspaper articles, which is incredibly rare for the period. Prior to her death, Rennie donated numerous scrapbooks, poems, correspondence, and artifacts to the Royal BC Museum. Eleanor's poems detailed their lives and experience as queer in a world that was unaccepting of their love, as well as her lifelong battle with PTSD that resulted from the war. Unfortunately, along with this 
wide scale mobilization that came as a first in Canadian history, there was another uh, first that came along, which was this massive, massive propaganda industry uh, led by the Canadian government during this period. And it was through this industry that the view of queerness would be transformed uh, from being seen as criminal behavior to actually becoming synonymous with traitorous and unpatriotic. This idea about queer people being untrustworthy is a time that emerges, is a, would emerge time and time again in Canadian history. And in this era, it was no exception. Uh, and queerness even became associated with the Germans, the enemy in, in this mind. Uh, how an entire country could be stereotyped as queer, you may ask. Well, the answer lies in a series of sensational court trials, where, which were known as the Eulenburg Affair, where several members of Kaiser Wilhelm's intimate circle of political and and uh, military figureheads were publicly tried for their sexuality. When the war broke out just five years later, this was quickly weaponized uh, and specifically through propaganda narratives. For example, this picture showcased here, um, which is entitled The Pals. It is a 1915 uh, British postcard from the war. Uh, and you can see that Kaiser Wilhelm here is uh, standing on his uh, tippy toes, uh, kissing, as you can see, the devil. Another example was a famous black book that originally surfaced in a 1918 parliamentary debate. Uh, one member of parliament, uh, Noel Pemberton Billing, declared there was a top secret book that contained the names of 47,000 prominent British citizens who were secret quote, homosexuals, <laughs> secret homosexuals, so to speak. Unsurprisingly, in the 100 years since this claim has been made, uh, no book has ever emerged in the records. But regardless, this was published widely throughout the British Empire and further emphasized this idea of queer people as untrustworthy and ill-suited for government roles, a concept that resurfaced once again uh, throughout Canadian history time and time again. Both of those circumstances escalated the already well-oiled machine of queer persecution in the Canadian government. And this witch hunt extended in the Canadian expeditionary force through the court martial system. And so let's understand the legal proceedings and why exactly it wasn't a fair trial, so to speak. The bulk of my research relies on court martial documents from the First World War. Courts martial were a part of the military court system that functioned as an extension of the legal system back home in Canada. As authorized by the 1881 Army Act, they had an authority to prosecute a wide range of both military and civil offenses. Because gross indecency was still criminalized in uh, in Canada at the time, this meant that individuals were arrested uh, under gross indecency legislation for the first time in centuries. For example, in France and Belgium, where queerness had been decriminalized since 1791. Or in Cairo, Egypt, where the occupying European, uh, the occupying uh, British Empire soldiers actually implemented gross indecency legislation through martial law as a way to curb the number of soldiers who were frequenting male sex workers. That law actually still remains um, a part of the Egyptian penal code and it is still one of the most dangerous places for 2SLGBTQA plus people in the world. And so every soldier after they were arrested, were immediately put in a military detention barracks. This is a picture of one uh, from 1908. These were military prisons, uh, and they spent their time in there before facing trial to see if they would go to actual prisons. Some would serve out their sentence in the military prisons themselves. After they were marched into the courtroom, uh, they were subsequently forced to defend themselves. 
uh, against a panel of judges that were made up of officers and higher ranking military officials, none of whom had any mandate to have either military legal training or civilian legal training. All they had to do was be an officer. Following the trial, the men were publicly outed uh, to the entire base. Uh, every single court martial result was read out uh, as a means of, it was kind of justified to encourage military discipline. Uh, but of course, this meant that for many of these individuals, they were publicly outed uh, to hundreds, if not thousands of their peers at a time. And so this is a firsthand account of what it would have been like to serve a sentence in a military prison. There were so many of us. There were four in some cells, and when we lay down, we were touching each other. The cell floors were newly cemented, and we had no board to lie on, just one great coat. Now, the conditions of these cells were bad. We were only let out for a short time, and there were no lavatory accommodations. A sort of wide bucket served the purpose. While in these detention centers, soldiers were also often punished with various military disciplines, such as field punishment number one, which involved being tied to a fixed object for two or more hours a day. But the harshest punishment was a prison sentence. Uh, and for some of the soldiers who were arrested, they were tried for essentially, they were given sentences for ranging from a year to up to 10 years in some cases. Uh, and we really need to separate our idea of modern prison systems from the penal system at this time. Uh, their experience is more comparable to a labor camp or a concentration camp. It was at its core, the goal was to dehumanize the individual who was incarcerated in every single way possible. And what's important to mention here is that the only crime these seven men committed was queer love and being born with, uh, not being born heterosexual. Not only were they punished for their sexuality, but they were systematically dehumanized for it by the Canadian government. In total of the 12 men who were incarcerated, seven served out their sentence in the penal, uh, British penal system. They were forced to wear name tags around their, number tags around their neck and were only known by those five to six numbers for the entirety of their imprisonment. They also had to complete tedious manual labor for 10 to 12 hours a day, which they had to do on minimal nutrition because the food in these prisons were actually designed to make them ill as an extension of the punishment. As well, they were forced to undergo the very, very rigid uh, restrictions around speaking. And it was forbidden uh, to speak to anyone, including the warden, unless you were going to make a formal request. If not, they could have been sentenced to severe punishments like solitary confinement, where they were only given bread and butter for three days at a time, or for example, straight jackets that were used. And while they all had their own cell, um, they were not alone in any sense of the way and could never truly feel comfortably alone because in every room there was a peephole by the door uh, that the warden could use to spy on them at any given moment. And so one soldier who experienced this is actually the young soldier Private Frederick Leah Hardy, who's from Brandon, Manitoba. 17-year-old Private Hardy was among these seven soldiers who were imprisoned in the penal system. He grew up in the town of Brandon uh, and had dropped out of school to help out his family's farm. In 1915, at the young age of 16, he was sent overseas with the 8th Battalion in the Canadian Expeditionary Force. While serving in Abiel, Belgium, in July 1916, Private Hardy was arrested for committing an act of gross indecency. He had just returned from the front lines and was enjoying a well-deserved rest period 
he and another soldier had attended a local establishment for a couple of drinks. They then wandered to a nearby field and they were arrested together. The next day, 17 year old Hardy found himself on trial with no lawyer, no jury of his peer, no jury of his peers and having to defend himself simply because of who he was and how he was born. He was sentenced to 18 months imprisonment with hard labor. Uh, and he served roughly eight months of that in the Winchester prison, which was one of the most brutal prisons at the time. He unfortunately only was allowed to, yeah, he unfortunately shortly after that was called back to the front line. Uh, because of significant losses at Vimy Ridge, he was faced with the choice of continuing his imprisonment or risking his death. He fought in August 1917 in the Canadian offensive at Hill 70. And it was there that Private Hardy was killed in action on August 15th, 1917. And because his body was never recovered, he is commemorated on the Vimy Memorial and is the only known queer soldier to be listed on there. Frederick Hardy lost his life fighting for a country that imprisoned him. And he spent the last few months of his short life being tortured because of his sexuality in the lonely halls of Winchester prison. And there were other types of punishments um, such as dismissal and cashiering. Some men were sentenced uh, for being, as you can see here in one of the files, an undesirable if they were arrested for gross indecency uh, in England. One such example is John McDonald, who was forced to serve out 15 months of his imprisonment and was then transported to Canada uh, where he was dismissed without a pension or any of his military honors. And what's important to take into account here uh, is something that we should look at when examining any type of research project, especially looking at the criminal justice system. Certain factors uh, such as race and linguistic background undeniably played into the trials themselves. And, and that is quite evident uh, given the, the data that I have. For example, there was a significant French Canadian component that I noticed. Uh, and so roughly, uh, French Canadians at large only represented about 12% of the broader enlistment population. Yet 32% of all of the court marshals for gross indecency uh, were for French Canadian soldiers. And additionally, almost half uh, of the men who were imprisoned, 45% uh, following their trials, were of French Canadian descent. This suggests that there was a a certain bias uh, within the French Canadian, like within the, the Canadian Expeditionary Force towards French Canadian soldiers. Another example is Private Louis Neely, who is one of the only uh, black men that I've come across in, uh, in this research. Uh, and he originally enlisted in 1916 uh, in the number two construction battalion. Uh, and he was born in Chicago, and he made his way up to Canada to fight. While serving with the number two construction battalion, he was arrested for gross indecency. His trial is graphically different than some of the others, and filled to the brim with racist slang, and he was just absolutely treated abhorrently. It's just a glimpse into the experience of the hundreds of Black Canadians who served. And yeah, it, it is quite difficult to read. Um, his gross indecency trial um, was struck down. And so he was not arrested. He was not in prison for it. However, four months later, he was incarcerated once again. Uh, and this was after he fought against a white Canadian soldier who was attacking him with a bat. Because he fought back, he was subsequently charged with uh, grievous bodily harm 
uh, and was sentenced to serve one year imprisonment with hard labor. In both of his trials, it was encouraged that he have a white Canadian speak on his behalf uh, so that it would be taken seriously. It's, I, I had never seen anything like it in the records. And it's very important to note because I can only imagine how other trials must have, have gone in this uh, scenario. And it's definitely, definitely worth investigating. And so he was imprisoned uh, in 1918 uh, and he luckily uh, for him was only uh, forced to serve about four months of that which he did in a military detention barracks. After that, the war actually ended. Uh, and so he was released uh, and uh, was released to the British Isles um, where he spent the rest of his days from what we can know. Unfortunately, the historical record loses Lewis a little bit there. Although we have really tried to look, he does not appear in the 1921 Canadian census or the 1920 US census. Uh, and the last known address we have for him is at a bookshop in Ripon, Yorkshire, uh, where he is listed as a, book a bookseller at a local store. And so I like to imagine that he spent the rest of his days living a quiet life, uh, coping with some of the hardships he dealt with uh, in selling books and, and in rural England. What's really important to stress here is that the underlying goal of all of this was to scare people into the closet. While I've only identified 21 men who were directly persecuted, so 19 um, within the Canadian Expeditionary Force and an additional three Canadian men who were arrested in the United Kingdom, there were presumably hundreds, if not thousands of queer individuals who were impacted by these laws and saw their love be depicted as criminal, unworthy, as indecent. For every person that the Canadian Expeditionary Force made into a public spectacle, there are undoubtedly hundreds of queer people who hated themselves for their shared commonalities. The 2SLGBTQIA plus community faces high rates of depression and suicide. And that is with all of the rights that we have fought so hard for. It hurts my heart to even imagine how exorbitantly higher those rates must have been back in this era. One man who experienced this uh, hands-on um, was Lieutenant Ross Hamilton. So he was one of the most celebrated performers of the war. Uh, and he, while he was not outed during the First World War, he would have undoubtedly, undoubtedly experienced this fear mongering firsthand. He was originally born in a seaside village of Pugwash, Nova Scotia in 1889. Shortly after he graduated high school, he did what many of us do here in Atlantic Canada and moved west. Um, he moved to Montreal uh, to work as a clerk. Uh, and dabbled in amateur theater. When the war broke out in 1914, he was quick to enlist and he served as an ambulance driver within the medical corps. If the photos don't already give it away, Ross eventually pursued female impersonation, uh, which eventually <laughs> evolved into drag today. And we can call the style of female impersonation that Ross had as a form of drag. He initially, uh, served in the ambulance corps, but on the road to Vimy Ridge himself and uh, some of his fellow uh, members of CAMAC uh, created this concert troupe called the Dumbbells. Uh, and he was selected uh, to serve as Marjorie, the female impersonator. He essentially crafted Marjorie's first outfit right in the French countryside in those early April 1917 uh, evenings. And he made Marjorie's first outfit out of tent canvas, curtains, feathers from pillows, and beads out of rosaries. And it took place just days before the offensive uh, in a barn near the French countryside. 
And from there, the dumbbells are worn. Ross was so popular that he had to change out of costume uh, for fear of being mobbed as, as he was heading back to the barracks. Uh, and he continued to perform with the dumbbells, uh, traveling throughout Europe for Canada's soldiers. And eventually, after the war, traveled across Canada and Europe, performing as the dumbbells. Shortly after um, the the war was over, him and the dumbbells served. Uh, him and the dumbbells performed on Broadway as well for a six week period, uh, and he recorded a, an incredibly popular album. After the war, Hamilton and the dumbbells toured North America and the UK, uh, and as I said, shortly before the Second World War, he was performing with another group that was called Chin Up. And when the war broke out, he enlisted in the army once again and referred to his former occupation as, uh, as an actress, in quotations. Marjorie, uh, in this time, was a classical opera singer. And once again, Ross found himself traveling Europe, performing for Canadian soldiers overseas. However, after one of Ross's shows, he was out in uh, and was quietly discharged, essentially forced into early retirement. However, like many queer people from history, Ross persevered and he still managed to find joy and bring so much positivity to the people around him in his retirement. He split time between uh, a log cabin he had in Truro, Nova Scotia and his hometown of Pugwash and was known as this incredibly warm and generous person. He lived a well-deserved quiet life, uh, tending to his garden, reading and running the local theater troupe. He died in 1965 at the age of 76 and his legacy has been largely erased from the history of the First World War because of his sexuality and the immense shame uh, that was associated with it for a very, very long time. And so I really want to stress why these stories matter. And I think one of the main reasons is because we're only just now able to tell it. For hundreds of years, these stories were buried. The experiences of these men and, and women and non-binary people during the war were never officially told and they've never officially been a part of the narrative of the First World War. I just wish that we could have a world where that could become the reality, where 2SLGBTQIA plus kids can grow up hearing about their community in Canadian history. And until we get there, this fight is not over and we must continue to tell stories like that of Ross Hamilton um, and the victims of the 2SLGBTQIA plus purge. So I'm gonna give you a bit of homework today. Um, and so here are a couple of ways uh, that you can help and help get the story told. First thing you can do is share the report and what you learned tonight. Uh, with your colleagues, with, um, I'm now realizing that it's tonight for me actually, but not for you folks, <laughs> I guess today, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, time zones, hey? It's, uh, um, so share the report and what you've learned uh, and continue to include these stories whenever you think of the First World War and whenever you think of Canada's history. You should also call on your representative officials to formally recognize this history and petition for a federal to us LGBTQIA plus Veterans Day. As well, actively challenge narratives of the First World War and that specific idea that is often associated with it of the typical heterosexual, cis, white, patriotic soldier who likely had a longing fiance back home. The war was a lot more diverse than that because history is. And we need to do our best to try and tell it. But above all else, 
you've already done one of the most important things by listening to this presentation today. Which is, you've remembered them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, wow, so much to take in. I am um, really happy that I was able to review the report before your presentation because it helped reinforce everything here. Uh, we do want to let people know that the full report is available uh, and you can find it on the LGBT Purge Fund. So please do look it up. I have put it in the chat for our attendees here. And when we were post this recording, we'll put it in the description there as well. I also really appreciate you including um, actions uh, and, and things that we can do. What has been your, your response so far uh, and regarding the petition for uh, LGBTQ plus um, Veterans Day? So we haven't done a specific um, petition yet. Um, more so we wanna start at the MP level and, and see where we can go from there. Um, I found a lot of support I think a lot of people have been harmed by these stories. Um, I mean, have been harmed by these experiences and have similar stories. Um, and so it's, I, I think it's incredibly, incredibly important. The big step right now is, and, and kind of my main priority, is eventually getting public recognition for this experience, for what these men went through. You know, I, I mean, the fact that the federal government still has yet to actually formally come out and talk about this, um, despite this, you know, us asking multiple times and, um, but you, we've yet to see it. Um, and so that is, is kind of the key, um, the key policy lobbying going forward is, is making sure that there are, it is known that there is a queer man on the memorial and that we can kind of honor that when we have Vimy ceremonies every year. I think that is kind of the, the first step and eventually, I, I, I aimed a bit high with that one, but that's the first step for sure. Yeah, uh, you mentioned as well, challenging that heteronormative um, narrative that we often hear. My wife and I are planning to go to Vimy Ridge this summer. We're going to be in the area. So I am going to ask about Hardy uh, when I visit there. And if if my two guide, tour guides don't know about them, I'll make sure they, they learn about this report uh, and, and share that. I think too, we have that responsibility as consumers of culture and history to ask about these stories and to look for that information. It's also why I'm, I'm also really happy you shared this story of Eleanor Parker and Myrnie Pugh. Uh, as you mentioned, we have um, some of their pieces here in the BC archives, but also we have Eleanor Parker's nursing uniform in our history collection. And about seven years ago, I was working on a pride event um, here at the museum and I was asking, what do we have in the collection? Uh, and I was told a little, you know, kind of hesitantly about uh, Eleanor's pieces, and there wasn't much appetite for me to present her as um, as a lesbian woman. Uh, and after, and I, I didn't pursue it much further. I was like, okay, I, okay, there isn't much evidence. Okay, but my goodness, um, if I had dug a little further, I wish I would have, um, because you shared some of the poems uh, with me when we were talking earlier, and. Um, as you were saying there, there's a lot of context. There's, well, she, she pretty much speaks about it, um, but there's a lot of other contexts, including uh, that they're buried together uh, side by side here at Ross Bay Cemetery. So um, a story that I will certainly look at um, talking about more in the future. That really means a lot. And I am pleased if you do go and visit, because of course, for me, um, I do love that we're able to do this you know, this presentation because we're like two islands. Um, <laughs> we've got all of Canada sandwich between us. Yeah. Um, 
So I would love to, if you could, if you do take a picture of her grave or, you know, it'd be amazing if someone could lay a little pride flag or, or something like that to, or, or, you know what, if we want to go really sapphic, you could lay some lavender. And <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that is, you know, that was one of the big barriers. There's something about the war that I think at its time, it challenged a lot of gender roles. And so in the wake of that and shaping how it was commemorated, because we think of commemoration as pretty apolitical, but the act of, of commemorating something is almost always, especially wars have, have a political goal behind it. Um, and so the, it, it's just fascinating because you can see how they tried in the aftermath of the war to really kind of cement this narrative. Um, and even, for example, um, the, the legacies of, of kind of famous out people in the war, um, you know, these stories of, of drag performers kissing their commanding officers, um, <laughs> like this is not included in, in discussions of it. And I, and I think part of that is because it was so revolutionary in a way. And, and we see that with the Second World War that it really starts to kick off the, um, you know, the, the, the liberation movement, especially in the, in the United States and later on in Canada as well. Um, but, you know, we forget that there was this little mini one for sure in the war. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so important. Well, that is the end of our time together. I want to thank you again, Sarah. And thanks for those of you who joined us live here on Zoom. And if you're watching the recording, if you found this program valuable and you want to watch it again or share it with others, it has been recorded and you'll find it on the Royal BC Museum's YouTube channel. So please have a look there. And pride celebrations are taking place uh, this summer around the country. So I thank you for including this as an opportunity to learn about historical injustices in Canada's past. And I encourage you to take a moment and think about how sharing these stories is a form of advocacy and of healing. Happy Pride, everyone. Take care of yourselves and one another. Happy Pride. <laughs>